start right now. So, uh, like I see that is uh, fourth year MedPeds uh, uh, resident, she graduated soon, and so, as you know, she needed to pick a topic uh, for a required grand rounds. And so, um, she decided to, uh, I think, pick a really important topic, one that we don't talk as much about now as we used to, and, and it's really important to keep on in mind. So, it's uh, pick your poison, um, and so, Emma C. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. So my topic this morning is pick your poison. Um, so this is an, it's not meant to be an all-inclusive. So for med students, you still have to study the topics and stuff of residents. Of course, whenever the time comes, you'll still have to look up the treatment. Um, but this is just kind of to pick your brain as well as to see some things that we don't always see um, every day, but they're still out there and are happening to many, millions and millions of children. So my topic is pick your poison. So some of my goals for this topic, um, for this presentation actually, is to learn the pertinent aspects of the history and physical exam related to acute poisoning with emphasis on the clinical recognition of the major toxic syndromes. So you're going to learn about the presenting signs, the symptoms, the laboratory findings, um, and some of the treatments and common therapeutic drug poisonings, as well as the drug abuse or the general household poisons with some case examples that we'll go through. Um, you're going to learn about how the poison prevention control system was created, some of the history behind it, who started it, and why it was started, as well as just learn as a pediatrician or another healthcare um, provider your role in poison control. So the objectives are going to define poison. Um, we're going to identify some specific toxidromes, review the initial assessment of a child with possible ingestion, describe the general management principles for ingestions and exposures, um, describe the likely presentation that's common. Um, for any fatal congestion, as well as the primary, secondary, and tertiary preventions that we have out there already, and the review the history, like I mentioned, of the Poison Control Center, and then what can we do as specialists to help? So I have no disclosures. Um, please do help yourself. I don't work with the Poison Control, but I did provide some um, items that they gave to me when I went to go visit last week. So what is poison? So it's a substance that's capable of causing illness or death of a living organism with introdu when introduced or absorbed. So the term overdose is sometimes interchangeable, um, becomes interchangeable with um, poisoning, but the term overdose implies intentional toxic exposure, either in the form of a suicide attempt or as an advertent harm secondary to the purposeful drug abuse. So the term poisoning and drug overdose, like I mentioned, is used interchangeably, um, especially when it comes to prescription drugs. Um, are the agents, even though definition of drug abuse or drug overdose does not produce poisoning unless it cause, causes clinical symptoms. So the routes of exposures can be ingestion, injection, inhalation, or cutaneous exposure. So the clinical definition, as I described it, is the human poisoning is any toxin-related injury. So the injury can be systemic or organ-specific, whether the neurological injury or you have liver damage. The source of the um, toxin can be synthetic, chemical, or naturally occurring plants, animals, or mineral substances. Um, this poisoning can include toxic effects of the classic toxin like cyanide poisoning and overdose of a prescription medicine, which we hear a lot, um, an example would be antidepressants, an overdose of an over-the-counter preparation like headache tablets or a complementary treatment such as herbal medicine or dietary supplements which has been really big lately. So all substances are poison. The right dose separates poison from a remedy. So here are some epidemiology, just um, a few pointers about poison control and poison. So the incidence of poison in the United States is approximately 4 million cases per year. Um, 300,000 of these cases lead to hospitalizations, approximately 30,000 deaths. So the CDC said that in 1990 to 2001, 56% of the poison death, um, it increased by 56% in those times. So in 2001, poison was the second leading cause of injury-related mortality, accounting for, like I mentioned, 30,000 deaths. And in 2003 and 2004, um, poison accounted for 18% of the injury deaths and 10% of the hospital discharges for injuries. So each year in the U.S., more than 1 million exposures among children younger than ages the six years of age, reported to the American Association of Poison Control. So most of the kids that I've seen too as well um, tend to be younger than six, if it's unintentional. 
And then the point down here is just to say approximately 100,000 to 140,000 exposures are reported for children 6 to 12 years old, as well as 150 to 170,000 exposures for teenagers from 13 to 19. So when you have a kid that's less than six years old, usually it'll be unintentional. Um, a lot of times when you have the children that are 13 and 19, more of your adolescents, you'll see more of your intentional, um, intentional injuries. And like I said, most of, this, um, most of the poison earth exposures usually occur at home. So in 2003, 2.4 million reports of toxins exposures were received by the poison control. So 76% were oral ingestions, 93% of those occurred at home, and more than 80% were unintentional, so those were the children less than six. And out of those, 51%, um, those were 51% of the exposures. And out of those, 38% involved children less than three. So about almost 2,000 fatalities from poisoning in 2003, including 27 children younger than six years, and 14 died after ingestion of prescription medication. And this just shows that pre-adolescence poisoning um, is male more than female on average. And then as far as teenagers go, it's more female than male. Um, and then the young children, unintentional, um, versus half of the teenagers are intentional. And then 60% in the 2016 exposures were intentional in teenagers. So some of the major four toxidromes are your anticholinergics, your sympathomimetics, opiates and sedatives, alcohol, and your cholinergics. So these are just showing some of the primary agents involved in the fatal poisonings among children in 1995 and 1998. So you have your typical analgesic drugs, your acetaminophen, your ibuprofen, which we prescribe a lot, quite often, oxycodone, your cleaning products. A lot of times when people put their cleaning products in their house, it's usually underneath the sink or very accessible um, can be to children. You have electrolytes and minerals, so that's your elemental iron. So a lot of times kids can get into their mother's prenatal vitamins, um, which consists of a good amount of iron. You have your hydrocarbons, the gasoline, um, lamp oil, your antidepressants, Antidepressants, like I mentioned, your amitriptylines, um, the pesticides, which are organophosphate poisoning, which I haven't seen yet, um, cosmetic and personal care products, your anticonvulsants, like your carbamazepine, your illicit drug use, um, plants can be one, sedatives, um, the cardiovascular agents, which I've seen, ephedipine, um, tobacco, cigarette buds can be common. And then, of course, your cold and co um, cough preparations, like we had the girl on the floor in the PI with a Dimetap. And other hormone and hormone antagonists, so glipizides, so when grandmother or mother have like oral, um, their oral anti-glycemic or the diabetes medicines has been a very common and possible fatal poisoning among children. So what's your general approach to poisoning? So first it's amount of triage, um, then it's the stabilization of the patient. Um, if you need to, some um, poisons you can already tell by history and physical exam, but um, some will help you need to kind of follow the laboratory assessments. Um, there's some decontamination for the GI tract, the skin, the eyes um, that can be used. You administer anti, um, antidotes if needed, um, elimination of enhancement of the toxin, or, and then observation and disposition. Where does a patient need to go or where does the child need to go? Does the child need to go to the emergency room, urgent care, or can the child be watched at home for some of, quite a bit of the poisonings or the ingestions? So your initial assessment, um, so the initial evaluation of a child um, poisons may be performed, like I said, in the office or in the emergency department. So if a physician receives a call in the office about a suspected poisoning, the first step is to ascertain or to assess is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, symptomatic meaning respiratory issues, any circulatory problems, any neurological symptoms. So if the patient is symptomatic, more than likely ambulance transport to the emergency room. If there's no local um, hospital, you can always go to a physician office. Um, and then the poison control as well as ambulance transport would be needed. If the patient is asymptomatic or if it's a non-toxic substance or the event is witnessed, um, prompt, ex prompt examination by the physician in the office, and then also can be dependent, so if you call the poison control, that can be dependent on how comfortable the guardian or the mother is about watching the child at home or um, watching the patient at home as well as kind of following up care or their transportation issues or anything like that. Um, there also can be a period of observation at home um, can also be appropriate, like I mentioned before. So this is your initial assessment and your triage. So when it comes to the stabilization, you're going to use the ABCDE approach, which is your airway, your breathing, your circulation, um, disability due to neurological deterioration. Um, IV access can be a good thing that 
you would likely need in some patient, monitoring the cardiac and the pulse oximetry, um, maintenance of the blood pressures and the tissue perfusion. Um, so after the ABCD, in some cases as well, like if the patient is, you have any altered mental status, lethargy, or you know the ingestion is an oral hypoglycemic agent, um, or there's alcohol ingestion, then you would get a blood um, glucose level. Um, the quick fix, just give them dextrose. Or if you know the patient has any cardiotoxic medications ingested, antidepressants, digoxin, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or other potent medications, um, then you would need to do an EKG. So you, you're pretty much trying to treat the patient, not necessarily the poison, because you're looking to see what the patient looks like um, first and foremost. Um, some of these ingestions of poisons, the patient's status can change um, very rapidly. So essentially, you have to reassess the patient, seeing if they need any ventilator support or any um, more support um, needed. So as we say, history is an important part of your, um, your visit with anyone, um, whether it's adult or children. So these are just some of the important history points that um, you want to know, especially if you have to call poison control as well. Um, these are some of the things that they may ask for. So you want to know, of course, the age of the patient, the sex, um, what toxic agent or medications were found near the patient, um, maybe some of what are the medications, other medications they may at home, if the parent or the grandmother or grandparent um, doesn't know what toxin or whatever um, they may have ingested. What's the approximate amount of the toxic in agent that was ingested? So how much was available? How much is still remaining in the bottle? Um, what ingestion occurred? Where, were there any other like, characteristic odors of this, at the scene of the ingestion? Was the patient alert on discovery? Has the patient remained alert since the ingestion has happened? Um, has the patient behaved the same since the ingestion? And does the patient have any history of substance abuse? And what was the method of the exposure? Was it a skin contact? Was it inhalation? Was it ingestion? Um, so a lot of times the history is not obtained until you have um, the patient is stable, of course. Um, but the method of exposure does tell the vital. The method of exposure is vital to detecting that if there was substance abuse or a suicidal attempt, especially relevant for your adolescent age group. So like I said, a thorough history and physical examination are usually sufficient, um, sufficient to diagnose um, most poisonings that happen in children. However, there are selective laboratory um, studies that can provide vital information or kind of can guide your monitoring and treatment. Um, these are some of them listed, which is your CBC. Um, you, need, you want to determine some of the electrolytes, the renal function, check the liver enzymes. Um, you may need an EKG, check an ABG, depending on the set clinical status of the patient, um, pulse oximetry. Um, the measurement of serum, salicylic, and um, acetaminophen levels are generally added in case of the patient um, if you don't know what the, if there's an unknown substance. It's an easy um, lab to order. Um, your in pregnancy test if you need to, your in drug screen. If the patient's at risk for any aspiration or pulmonary edema, then you'll do a chest x-ray. If there's any trauma-related injury or incident that you um, may be aware of, you can do a CT scan. And sometimes just because um, someone may have ingested something, there could still be other causes that be, could be why the patient has altered, there's an altered mental status. Or, so, so doing some of these lab work can kind of help you also to see that is there a secondary cause to why this patient may present this way. Um, if you're thinking meningitis as well as any fever and coma, then you would do a lumbar puncture. But don't just get um, spearheaded to the idea that the patient took something as well. Okay. So for many years, all the poisonings were treated the same. Um, they had the same protocol. They had aggressive um, decontamination and standard antidote regimens. Um, there is some controversy as to which patients will likely benefit from decontamination. Um, so physicians can kind of consider the, the type of ingestion, the substance used, the potential toxicity, and also the elapse um, since the ingestion incurred, occurred, like the symptoms that have now exhibited since. So these are just some of the ocular um, decontamination um, management. So the initial management of all of these injuries require irrigation, which you can use sterile water, lactated ringers, and normal saline, sometimes what's available. Um, if you have any topical anesthetic um, for early application, recommended. Um, but that's not always available as well. The upper and lower eyelids should be retracted, inspected for any retained solid material, injury, and irrigated. And then if there's any burns, then, of course, opto um, referral is ne if necessary. And skin, you just remove the contaminated clothing, wash, and water. And also if there's any, um, whether it's organophosphorus or anything, if any personnel, emergency personnel, presents to the scene, they should also have um, protect themselves as well. Okay. 
So there's relatively few studies that have been conducted on the effectiveness and the safety of the outcomes of gastric lavage. Um, the American Academy Clinical Toxicology, um, and I think it was the European Association um, of Poison Centers, actually discourage now um, sometimes the routine use of the gastric lavage um, in emergency settings if, unless, of course, the physician is practice well trained as well as um, if the ingestion is less than one hour. So what is a gastric lavage? So it involves the blind placement of a large bore gastric tube into the stomach in a patient who can either protect his airway, his or her airway, or whom the airway has been protected by an endotracheal tube. So the goal is to remove the toxin um, remaining in the stomach through a combination of insulation of water or physiological saline um, and is followed by the suction and the gravity induced drainage. So you're going to continue to repeat. And like I said, the indications is that there's a recent injection, less ingestion less than one hour, and unless the ingestion involves agents that um, decrease gastric motility, such as anticholinergics or some of the indications. The contraindication would be if there is a low viscosity petroleum product used um, or if there's inability to protect the patient's airway. Adverse effects, hypoxia, as you can imagine, perforation of the gastric tract or pharynx, um, aspiration, pneumonitis, and this can also potentially cause electrolyte abnormalities. So activated charcoal, this is also um, controversial sometimes in terms of the routine use of um, activated charcoal except within the hour of ingestion. Um, and there, I didn't find it great evidence to show that later administration improves clinical outcomes. Um, but activated charcoal, it binds to the um, substances rendering it less available for a systemic absorption from the GI tract. Um, a single dose of one gram per kilogram in children with a max dose of 50 um, in adults is 25 to 100 grams. And it's administered with um, water or via the nasogastric tube. So some of the indications for act, um, activated charcoal would be phenobarbital, um, theophylline, acetaminophen, phenytoin poisoning. Um, your contraindication would be in case the patient has gastric um, intestinal hemorrhage or any perforation. Um, in a patient in whom the airway protection is not assured, um, as well as in the case of any mechanical bowel obstruction. Some of your adverse reactions and complications would be vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, pulmonary aspiration, and then if the direct administration into the lungs via the, like the misplace of the nasogastric tube is also an adverse reaction. So whole bowel irrigation, this is another form of decontamination. So this involves administration by mouth or in the nasogastric tube of large amounts of solution um, with the goal of removing any unabsorbed um, toxicant from the GI tract. Um, so the dose is 25 milliliters per kilogram per hour for four to six hours with a total dose of 500 milliliters per hour under the age of six, um, 1,000 milliliters per hour under the age of 10, and then adolescence is increased. So some of the indications would be iron, lithium, toxicity, any drug packets used, um, your contraindications, of course, your GI hemorrhaging, or any mechanical or functional obstruction. So the antidotes. Only a small portion of poison patients are, um, can use the antidotal therapy. The patient is stable within a few hours of ingestion. You may require multiple antidotes depending on the availability. Um, there are a few poisonings where the antidote therapy is urgent, carbon monoxide, cyanide, organophosphate, opioid intoxication. Um, glucose must be given immediately for hypoglycemia, which is a quick fix. And then prompt administration of a naloxone may avoid um, need for endotracheal intubation and opioid overdose. Of course, antidotes with skin um, antivenoms for, um, for snakes. So these are just some of the specific antidotes and their um, usage. So ethylene glycol would be your ethanol, your nitrates, you have your methylene blue, your beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, which is glucagon, carbon monoxide poisoning, you use your oxygen, isoniazid, you use your pyridoxine, cyanide, that's when you use your sodium nitrate, sulfonylureas, um, you treat them with glucose arctreotide, um, TCAs, you use your sodium bicarb, um, and then your snake bites, use your antivenom as well as midazolam used with caution your fumazinil. And these are some of the other common ones. Your opioids, you use your naloxone. Your acetaminophen, you use your N-acetylcysteine. Iron, defroxamine, digoxin, you use digiban. And your organophosphates, you use your atropine. These are just some of the elimination enhancement of toxins. So you have forced diuresis, which pretty much is just giving your maintenance fluid um, two to three times the rate, so you're trying to increase the urine output to two to five cc's per hour. 
Um, you'll use your urine alkalinization to eliminate weak acids. This is for your salicylates or your barbiturates poisoning. Um, and this can just be achieved by adding sodium bicarb to the fluid. And your hemodialysis um, used for some poisoning is barbiturate, methanol, um, heavy metals, and lithium. Okay. So supportive care for some, and then the disposition, as I mentioned, is important um, as far as monitoring and continued observation. If you have a low risk, it's minimal symptoms or um, the toxic ingestions, and there's no expected, um, nothing to happen afterwards or discharge, you can go home with short observation. If you're more of a high risk, like intentional ingestions, patients who exhibit um, continued toxidromes or prolonged symptoms, usually have been admitted to the hospital for ongoing treatment. Um, if it was intentional, then a psych consult would be needed. And then if you want to also look, because sometimes you'll see um, there's repeated instances of unintentional poisonings, whether mom has multiple kids, twins, or anything like that. So you want to just kind of be aware of that and discuss any preventative measures and examine caregiver situation um, for possible child neglect or child abuse. So what is ingestion? In this picture, you can't really tell the difference between some of them are candy or some of them um, are medications. So a lot of the time, toddlers and the preschoolers, the most common injection is acetaminophen, which we prescribe all the time. Um, the most common fatal injection is iron. Um, in adolescents as well, the most common ingestion is the acetaminophen, and the most common fatal ingestion is cyclic antidepressants. So we'll just talk about, this is some kind of case, very simple case, um, I guess cases that I made um, to talk about the different types of poisoning. So case number one, you're called to transport a 16-year-old girl after she tells her boyfriend, I took as many Tylenol as I could. She denies other ingestions or medication use. Ingestion occurred three hours prior to um, the call. So as it progresses, the patient is anxious, diaphoretic, nauseated, physical exam, mildly tender abdomen, heart rate of 120, respiratory rate of 20, blood pressure 100 over 70. Do you transport this patient? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So acetaminophen most likely used pediatric analgesic on the market, most common in toddlers and preschoolers. Um, Normal cytochrome P450 metabolism yields um, free oxidates. So it happens in a, um, multiple stages. So the first stage was usually about 4 to 12 hours. Um, you have nausea and vomiting. The second stage, about 24 to 48 hours, to be asymptomatic, um, increase in the liver function test. Stage 3, you'll have liver dysfunction with your elevated prothrombin time. And stage four could be seven to eight days later, um, as well as further out, there'll be resolution of the liver injury. This is just a table showing the time of the following ingestions, as well as the characteristics, like I mentioned, the nausea, vomiting, um, the peak in the LFTs, um, the four days to two week death in patients with fulminant liver failure, um, or resolution of hepatic failure in your survivors. So greater than one month, mild um, liver function abnormalities may still persist. So the kinetics dictate that the serum level should be checked every four hours. So if you have a patient that comes in with Tylenol intoxication, the toxic dose is 150 milligrams um, per kilogram. The four-hour toxic level is 150 milligrams per deciliter. And you just um, there's a monogram that's available to kind of guide your management. Um, you can't see it here, but it'll just show you the lower limit for a high-risk group, um, the lower limit for a probable risk group, and then if you're in the safe zone. So this patient was given charcoal, but the four-hour level was still high, and these are just showed some um, uses for um, activated charcoal. So what do you do now? So now this will be the N-acetylcysteine therapy. So it's proven to be 100% effective when given within the 8 to 16 hours of ingestion. Um, you load the patient with 140 milligrams per kilogram orally, and then you complete the regimen with sub 17 subsequent um, doses of 70 mg per kg every four hours. Um, if you give the IV form, you load 50 mg per kg over four hours, and the maintenance is 100 mg per kg over 16 hours. Okay. So this one is a 12-year-old boy who was dared by his friends to drink from a bottle of antifreeze. He swallowed a few gulps and then yelled and dropped the bottle. His father utters a few choice words and calls the ambulance. So as the case progresses, upon arrival, the child has clumsy movements with decreased level of consciousness. His vital signs heart rate is 120, respiratory rate of 20, blood pressure of 80 over 50, temperature is 37.4 Celsius, and a weight of 45 kilograms. 
What class of toxin has this child ingested? So alcohol. And why can't he just sleep off this antifreeze? <laughs> so this, this is alcohol. So ethanol, um, some of the side effects is hypoglycemia. You have an osmolar gap, ketoacidosis. Methanol um, poisoning can lead to blindness, a large osmolar gap, and metabolic acidosis. Ethylene glycol can lead to renal failure, um, where you get their calcium oxalate crystals, another osmolar gap, as well as metabolic acidosis. So alcohol metabolism, ethylene glycol is broken down from ADH to oxalate acid, so it results in renal failure, as I mentioned. Methanol breaks down a formic acid, resulting in the blindness. Ethanol, just um, ADH to CO2 and water, results in drunk. And isopropanolol results in really drunk, but it's still broken down from CO2 to water. Okay, so this is just the osmolar gap, how it's measure, measured, how it's calculated two times the sodium plus the glucose over 18 um, plus the BUN over 2.8. Your normal is 10 to 15, and all alcohols can cause an elevated osmolar gap. Um, these are your anion gap, the common um, mud piles. So methanol is on there, ethylene glycol is on there, um, and that's how you calculate your anion. So the patient has an osmolar gap and metabolic acidosis consistent with ingestion of ethylene glycol. So now what do you do? <laughs> so the therapeutic intervention, the old one used to be IV ethanol. Um, so it competes for the ADH to prevent buildup of toxin metabolites. Um, the treatment now is a pemepazole, um, so that blocks the ADH and usually the patient will require the ICU admission. Okay. So your case number three. You arrive at home where a parent called 911. You find a five-year-old girl who's crying, rubbing at her eyes, arms, yelling, get the bugs off of me. Temperature is 102, heart rate of 150, respiratory rate of 23, blood pressure 100 over 60. The skin is flushed, pupils are dilated, and extremities are warm and dry. Her neuro exam is non-focal. What toxidrome is this? What you just okay. okay. Anticholinergic. So what do you do? Do you transport the patient to the nearest ED with lights and sirens, recognizing child ingested a substance? Do you tell the mother, or the, do you tell the mom her child is hallucinating and call psych? And do you, or do you run away because you're deathly afraid of insects? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Captain, for participating. So your anticholinergic, your antihistamine is your mad as a hatter, your red as a beet, um, dry as a bone, hot as a hair, blind as a bat. Um, so your CNS will be your agitation, your hallucinations, your coma, um, circulation, looking for tachycardia, arrhythmias, hypertension, skin is warm, flush, dry, and your eyes mydrysis. Um, you can use gastric decontamination charcoal, supportive care depending on how much was taken. Um, the antidote which was used, um, glyzostigmine, so that's if unstable vital signs, coma, or the patient is not getting better. Um, the dose is 0.5 milligrams for IV for children and the teen is one to two milligrams IV. Contraindicated, the patient has a wide QRS, so you have an EKG prior to use. Okay. So grandma says her 18-month-old grandson isn't acting right. Um, she's concerned that the child may have ingested some of her medication. She lists her medications either digoxin from rosamide or as most of the patients in my clinic always say, some antihypertensive medication. So examination reveals lethargic child with one to two millimeter pupils. The bottle signs a heart rate of 70, respiratory rate of 12, blood pressure 80 over 45, temperature is 37, weight is 13 kilograms. So which medication did he take? Was it a digoxin, furosemide, other hypertensive, or opiate? That's the actual medication right there in the picture. Does anybody know by the picture what the medication is being? Does anybody think it was digoxin that was taken? Does anybody think it was furosemide? Does anybody think that it was a hypertension medication? Okay. So it was clonidine. So clonidine, even when I went to the, um, to the poison control center, um, the, one of the guys that I spoke to there said that a lot of times clonidine has been one of the most frequent calls, especially within the last year for some reason. Um, in my clinic generally, um, I don't prescribe clonidine too much um, as far as the um, hypertension medication just because of uh, medication compliance and the side effects of clonidine. Um, some patients are, of course, already on it. Um, 
But clonidine is a central acting antihypertensive, also used to treat narcotic withdrawal. Um, it does come in small tablets or the patch form. Um, so you also want to, upon with your physical exam, always make sure that the patient you look everywhere because patches can be um, placed anywhere. Uh, lowers the blood pressure. You get the transient hypertension, um, the coma. And then naloxone may work to reverse the respiratory depression. So always remember to support the breathing because there can be a rapid decline with um, clonidine overdose. Um, the symptoms usually present like someone who took a op had an opioid overdose. Um, unlike the treatment for many other types of drug overdose, though, um, activated charcoal and lavage are not necessarily recommended for clonidine um, due to the rapid onset of the CNS depression. So you'll see lethargy, seizures, slow respiration, pulmonary edema, hypotension, and bradycardia, as well as the eye changes. So this is case five. A five-year-old girl was at school when she developed nausea, vomiting, and bloody diarrhea. So she reports that she ate some of her mom's um, prenatal vitamins at breakfast. The bottle contained 30 pills of ferrous sulfate and is now empty. So this is iron. Toxic exposure is based on the elemental iron load. So most children's preparations contain less than the adult forms, which is ex expected. So children have 3 to 25 milligrams per pill, and the adults have 37 to 65 milligrams. Um, the toxic dose for iron is 40 to 60 milligram per kilogram of the elemental iron. Um, the, le um, the lethal dose would be the one milli 180 milligrams per kilogram of the elemental iron. So as far as the clinical presentation, this also happens in stages. So you have the GI stage, which will be the nausea, the vomiting, the bloody diarrhea, um, severe fluid loss. Um, the relatively stable stage around the 6 to the 24 hours, um, you can see clinical improvement. Um, sometimes you'll see some subtle hemodynamic changes where they have tachycardia, decreased urine output. Um, there is a shock stage um, where coma, shock, seizures, um, as well as the next stage within 48 to 96 hours. Um, this is where you have increased mortality. Um, liver necrosis and liver damage. Um, two to six weeks, you can see GI, the GI scarring. This is just a picture showing um, the iron on the abdominal x-ray. Okay. Management, you're going to do gastric decontamination, so that's um, the lavage with the 5% bicarb, no activated charcoal. Of course, you'll need an IV, um, secure a good IV, and then as well, you just use a chelating agent depending on the levels of the iron. So you're observing for any changes in the um, blood pressure, seeing if you need um, EKG, any signs of hepatic failure, bleeding. Um, if the glucose is elevated, you may monitor the um, ammonia levels and also assess the patient for any encephalopathy. Case number six. So you have a six-year-old boy who was playing outside and returned to his house with respiratory distress. You arrive on the scene and you note him to be let, um, lethargic, diaphoretic, and in mon moderate distress. So physical exam reveals brails and wheezing in all lung fields with oral secretions, one millimeter pupils. His vital signs, heart rate was 50, respiratory rate of 70, blood pressure 90 over unknown, and temperature is 37.8, and your weight is 25 kilograms. This is what, it was organophosphate poisoning is a toxidrome, and these are um, just the mnemonic dumbbells, your diarrhea, your urination, your bradycardia, your emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. So your management, the first thing, of course, you would do is remove the clothing for any um, for skin decontamination. Um, atropine is used, vagal block, so it dries the secretions, um, decreases the bronchoconstriction, and increases the heart rate. In large doses, you may use 0.5 to 10 milligrams IV, and then you have your um, perlidoxine, so your 2 pam, which regenerates the acetylcholine esterase. So that's 20 to 50 mg per kg per dose in the IM or IV form. In the last case, so three-year-old has fever, progressive sleepiness, and respiratory distress two hours after drinking some oil of wintergreen from the kitchen cabinet. The patient was noted to be lethargic and tachypnic. So the patient responds to the mother's voice, and there's no vocal um, findings on neuro exam. The vital signs are a heart rate of 140, respiratory rate of 60, um, blood pressure is 90 over 70, temperature is 40 Celsius, and the weight is 12 kilograms. And you get an eye stat which shows your pH, your CO2, and your bicarb there. So this is salicylate poisoning. So you're looking for the metabolic acidosis with the respiratory alkalosis. So that's salicylate toxicity until proven otherwise. 
Um, you'll see the increased temperature in this case, heart rate, respiratory rate. It can alter the platelet function and the bleeding time. Um, May develops the reboidema, secondary vasoactive um, effects, and then, of course, the ear ringing. Um, these are just some of the clinical manifestations that happen. Severe intoxication can lead to seizures, hypoglycemia, pulmonary edema, and um, possible death from cardiovascular collapse. So the toxic dose would be over 150 mg per kg. The therapeutic dose is 10 to 15 mg per kg. Um, and here's your management. You use, do the urine alkalization with the sodium bicarb to maintain the pH greater than 7. Um, hemodialysis may be used. It's very effective for drug removal and to control the acid-base balance. So you're just looking at the acute ingestion versus chronic, um, the persistent rise in the um, ASA, the renal insufficiency, as does the patient have altered mental status, or as a metabolic acidosis, a refractory metabolic acidosis. So this is just a little more about the poison control, um, just some history behind it. Um, like I said, I listened to, um, um, it was a podcast that was actually kind of um, started my process and why I wanted to do this topic that told me about, it was talking about the start of the poison control, why it was started, who started it. So this is just some brief history about how it all happened. So pretty much at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, there was no um, modern specialty of tex, um, toxicology. There were no poison control centers at that time, um, no oversight as far as pharmaceutical manufacturing, manufacturing or drug labeling, and there was little knowledge regarding um, the treatment of poisons in the U.S. Um, so what happened was there was issues of misbranding, mislabeling, um, food and drugs were considered. So the U.S. in 1820, the U.S. pharmacopoeia was created. In 1847, that's when the American Medical Association and then 1852, that's when the American um, Pharmacists Association. There was a Food, Drug, and Insecticide Administration, what it was called before, which later became the FDA in 1930. So subsequently, there was um, the federal government has passed multiple laws, created regulations, and proposed other controls and management of poisoning throughout the years, um, and the Child Protection Act, Emergency Services System of 1973. These are just a few of the acts. So as public health concepts were in their formative stages, surveillance of toxic exposures and the morbidity and mortality um, associated with these exposures were virtually, virtually unknown until kind of the creation of these. So this is the timeline. So in 1930, um, child poisoning recognized as a significant component of pediatric practice. Um, in the early 1930s, there was a pediatrician at Duke University that began to systematically collect information regarding toxic ha um, hazards. Um, so he provided more information and advice to physicians and not necessarily the public at that time. So there was a pharmacist in Chicago around the World War II um, era who collected information um, and developed a toxicology information system, which they talk about in the podcast, where he used index cards. Um, and then he had about 9,000 commercial and consumer products. Um, he, was, he was pretty much on call 24 hours of the day because he was the only person that was taking those calls um, at that time that they knew of. So in 1950, the American Academy of Pediatrics established its um, Accident Prevention Committee, and they surveyed about 3,000 AAP members and find that 49% of them reported that these accidents um, treated by their members involved poisoning. So in 1953, that's when um, Dahlman and Edward Press um, first developed the formal poison control center in Chicago. And Dahlman's established um, the precursor to the modern poison control centers, which now personally take calls 24 hours in the day. So the centers has developed as many as 265 by 1958 and 661 by 1978. Um, 1958, the AAP annual meeting, that's when the American Association of Poison Control Centers was founded, and it continues to serve as a voluntary association for poison control centers. In 1960, individual responding um, to calls were more of clerical persons, pediatric house officers, or other interested people, so there was neither training nor educational materials, materials were standardized. Um, then there was a transition towards standardization by creating index cards containing information on these drugs, chemicals, household products, and plants, and a monthly newsletter summarizing some of the poisoning literature. So the increasing expectation for the centers, now they have certifications. Um, I was talking to one of the gentlemen that worked there, and they said, yes, you have to take an exam every seven years, and before you're certified, you have to have a certain number of phone calls um, to be certified to work in the poison control center. Um, and due to the financial support as well as economically driven services or cutbacks from hospitals and teaching institutions, 
They've now decreased the number of centers um, dramatically over the last three decades, and now there's 55 poison control centers, and the one in Louisiana is here in Shreveport around the corner down the street. So poison control is not just, um, even though in the room there are, there were three people in the room when I was there um, answering phone calls. One was a pharmacist, one was an ER trained, PICU trained nurse, and the other one was an MICU um, adult trained nurse. Um, so they just don't, it's not just about sitting there answering the calls from physicians or people at home. Um, poison control, even when I talked to the director there as well, there are a lot of different things that they're working on with the CDC, whether it's the FDA, a lot of public health initiatives and products, or things that um, the data collection that they receive from the poison control has changed a lot of um, care that we do now versus like, um, for example, um, the caps or something on medication bottles or um, certain bottles for kids to be able to open so it's childproof, um, stuff like that. So they do the phone consultations regarding individual exposures, potential exposures or information, um, the capacity to respond to mass exposure, potential exposures, so like for example, if maybe um, with like E. coli or any kind of lettuce or any type of um, exposure that's come, you can kind of see what areas some of these, a lot of these calls have been coming to. Um, they do the data collection and reporting. So research, it helps with toxicology and healthcare delivery. Um, and you can do program evaluation like any quality improvement project projects within the hospital or um, the clinic settings. Public education as well as professional education. So why might we care? So a lot of it also too is about um, funding and money. So the thing with the poison control is that a lot of these calls, like I mentioned before, are coming from home, whether it's concerned parents, concerned guardians, and the idea is, of course, it's up to them to come to the emergency room, um, but at the end of the day, if you can stay, keep the patient at home or keep the family at home and be observed, you're saving costs as far as ambulance, you're saving emergency visits, hospital hospitalizations, and all that is um, cost. So this is just one example to show um, how much can be saved. So this is the Banner Poison Control Center. Um, approximately 40, min 40 million people are um, watching the center in Arizona. So they received 28,000 calls at home in 2007, and approximately 70% were sought um, unnecessary care, would have been unnecessary care in the ED. So the median of 33 million in unnecessary health care charges were prevented by this home management, and about $36 in unnecessary health care charges were prevented for each dollar of state funding received. So the use of poison control means lowering the cost of, like I said, ambulance, transport, emergency room, or potential hospitalizations. Um, and there were about three calls while I was there. One mom called because um, a child took those gummy vitamins. Another person called because I think there was an adult that had taken um, metoprolol, like 10 to 15 tablets of metoprolol. And, this, and then there was one other call about, um, I think, either bleach or something the child had gotten into. And this was all in the span of just talking between 15 to 20 minutes. So you can only imagine how many phone calls they receive in 24 hours and how many parents, I mean, at the end of the day, they're calming down just to kind of see if they need to come to the emergency room or not. So the main thing is prevention, prevention, prevention. How do you keep people at times out of the hospital? So this is primary prevention, which encompasses all the activities that prevent a poisoning event from occurring. So these are like the legislation, the um, product engineering, and the, um, the educational effort. So some examples would be clinicians should consider the risk of poisoning when they prescribe medications and use less toxic therapies when appropriate. So one prime example that we do a, a lot is the liquid medication for our patients. Um, so mom says she gave her child Tylenol, how much? I don't know. I just use this amount and what's this amount? I don't know. Um, so the biggest thing would be like a lot of times, of course, we would give them, you know, for the weight, the age, Give them the information. Some of them, depending on how they are, you have to give them, you know, the syringe. Mark on there how much they should take um, because a lot of the calls they said, too, they'll say, you know, I gave this much extra of the Tylenol. Like, is this appropriate? So letting the mom know before you leave, before they leave the clinic or the visit, how much is appropriate. And also, too, when to call. When will they need these services um, will be good. And doing the anticipatory guidance as needed. Um, some other examples of primary in, um, prevention would be the restraint containers, the secure cabinet doors, or like the locks on the door as well. And then uh, your secondary prevention involves interventions that prevent the injury or the illness. So once the poison exposure has occurred, um, so this is more of like the poison controls or the various methods of decontamination. And then your tertiary prevention involves the interventions that minimize injury or toxic effort um, effects once the symptoms have appeared. 
So these would include like emergency medical services, the inpatient care that you need, and the administration of the antidotes. This is just the phone number. Um, so like in all, even in my um, well child clinic note, I do have, like I do tell the parents about what the poison control number is. Um, and if they text this number um, on their phone, text poison to this number, the poison control contact um, information automatically uploads to your phone. That's if you have a smartphone. That is it. So the biggest thing is what can we do um, um, as far as keeping our patients, as far as the ingestions, which that also can include you know, when the kids come in with batteries or coins or anything, of course, that's telling your parents. I mean, it's hard to keep an eye on a two-year-old or at all times, um, but a lot of times it's just keeping things out of reach. And whenever you can talk to them, whether that's in the newborn nursery, your well-child visits, your emergency room visits, it's good to let your, your parents or your guardians know um, when to call, what to call. And even here, um, they said that the better, the earlier the poison control is called, the better. I didn't know that um, they told me that even when we call sometimes during a hospital visit, they actually call back some of the cases, they call back to check. Um, and I didn't know that. And they said that even if we don't speak to the physician, a lot of times they'll call the nurses to update, you know, get an update on the child, how the child doing. And these updates help with, you know, so if somebody else calls again, you know, what they can be able to tell other people what they should do or what needs to be done. Um, so it's just kind of the spread of information and how better that can help our patients in the future. So if you all can, you can definitely pick up um, something. So for the people who did pick this up, there is something inside of there. And so you can drink it and see. You can pick your poison. <laughs> Any questions, comments, concerns? Yes. You might not have touched on this just from talking to them, but what kind of liability do they carry? What kind of what? Liability do they carry? If they tell the mother, stay home, because mm -hmm. you talked about the financial aspects of keeping people home. Does the Poison Control Center carry the liability if they tell someone to stay home mm -hmm. and then something happens, or does that? That's actually, I didn't, I didn't ask that. That's a good question. Because I know even when there was the call about the metropolis, I mean, he literally talked to the, to the mom or the patient within like just not even five minutes and said, call back in 30 minutes if something happens. And I don't, yeah, so I'm not, that's a good question. Because I mean, at the end of the day, too, it's one of those things where, I mean, if your friend has somebody to, you know, that calls and says, I have this going on, you always tell them, like, at the end of the day, whatever you feel, you need to go to the emergency room, then go. I mean, it's all ultimately up to them. I'm not sure what the lab is. I'm not sure how they're going to identify it. Yeah. 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 Yeah then we can't make changes. And so Dr. Arnold has also told us that all the different Tylenol overdoses they found came from the infant drops. And so they have actually been able to go to the makers of Tylenol and get them to repackage so that that doesn't happen anymore. Tide Pods was the same thing. Before the teenagers got real stupid, the little kids were eating the Tide Pods because they looked like candy. And so they went to the manufacturers and got them to package them differently so that they don't look quite so enticing and they're harder to get into. So even if you know how to treat this, you still need to call because one of their major functions is data collection. And like you said, they call the families back later and check up on them. We don't do that. We're busy, we forget, we don't do that. But poison control calls the families back later. And it doesn't have to be a medication. My nephew turned up one of the Glade plug-ins while I was at my sister's house one day. I'm like, are you really gonna make me call poison control when I'm off? But I, I called. And they called her back the next day to check and make sure he was okay. And another thing about um, medications too is that, well, I do this more for my older patients, but um, I actually tell them to bring, like I always look at their medication bag every single time because what it may be in the chart saying they take, but when they actually pick it up, there's a lot of different like formulas and even Dr. Arnold, so I talked to him last week too about this and he said that um, Tylenol, even though they've changed, some of the medications have changed like the milligrams per kilogram dosing to try to get standard dosing, but some of the um, medications they gave, yeah, generics come and they still don't have the actual dosing on them. So always look at what the patient is actually putting in their mouth is the important thing too. 
Yeah, other questions, comments? So, um, do we give our patients the number to poison control as part of well child care? Should. Hmm? Should. Do we? Do we? Are y'all handing out magnets and stickers for well child visits? I brought some there for you. <laughs> okay, so we, can, so we can start today. But I think that that's one of the things that in terms of anticipatory guidance and preventive medicine, you have a significant opportunity to reduce these risks. And this is one that's really common. Um, and there are remedies for trying to deal with it. And so making sure your parents know what you would like them to do if something like this happens is really important. And so that can be part of your well, well, baby care, well, child care, and you do it in an age-appropriate time. Uh, so, I mean, talk about um, locking up the, uh, the the cabinet under the sink and all those other things, but also having poison control of, uh, number is really important. So, all right, other questions or comments? All right, very nicely done. Thank you.